Um, thank you for signing up for the course. And for those of you that did the course, thank you for coming back for this second one on Point of View. Um, I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about who I am and how I've arrived here. So um, I originally trained as an actor. I trained at RADA and I acted for 10 years in theatre mainly, but also television and, and film. Um, before moving on to work as a Equal Communication Collective. But my passion has always been writing. And quite recently, I, I finished a master's at Goldsmiths in creative and life writing. And I'm working on um, uh, a novel at the moment, which is actually a hybrid between life writing and fiction. Um, but I was really keen to run this course for Genesis because um, I, I feel in awe of the research that they do into reproductive health and because of my own difficulties with pregnancy, I wanted to give something back. So I, I also felt inspired because of our current situation, because of the lockdown. I think it's a great opportunity for us to be creative in this time and also to reflect on our lives. Um, so I thought it was a, a real opportunity to run this course in collaboration with Genesis. Um, we've heard a little bit from, from a few of you about what brought you to the course, um, but it would be really great just to hear any other thoughts from people. Why specifically you signed up for this course, if you're happy to share. Is anyone willing to, to share their, their view? Yes. Well, I saw your note that um, there's only 20 pence in every hundred pounds given to independent research into reproductive problems. Mm. And um, I think that is so little. And I yeah. think Genesis need every penny it gets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's why I signed up a second time. And Emmy, from um, a writer's point of view, um, I mean, Patricia, yes, or Janet, what, what, what was it specifically you were saying about um, this course earlier? But go on, Janet, sh share with us what, what you thought. Just need to unmute yourself. You're on mute, You're on mute Janet. Sorry, I was because I, 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 I talk too much, so I mute, I mute myself. Um, yeah, so I've got a double reason why I'm on this particular memoir. Um, from a Genesis point of view, it's kind of linked to reason, the other reason. Um, in, two, in the year 2000, my uh, twin and I did um, a fundraising challenge, uh, a, a massive bike ride across Israel, um, Jordan and Egypt for what was then, uh, it was then Queen Charlotte. It was, um, um, but um, th it's, it, it isn't the same charity. I think Nikki backed me up on this. It kind of morphed. Um, it's evolved, yes. Absolutely. Yes. So it wasn't called Genesis then, but it, it was exactly the same reasons because my, my twin and I always had difficulties and didn't actually have children. But um, we did the bike ride, which was very challenging. Um, and um, the reason I'm doing the reason I was attracted by the memoir side is that since I lost my twin in 2004 and ever since 2006 which is a long time ago I've been absolutely determined to write our story and for some reason it took me absolutely ages to be able to yeah. so this when I saw um was it an email I got from Nikki when I saw your first workshop it was like right this is this is a sign you know this is this is the green light and I just, um, it was like when I did your other one, um, Emma, it was just like the door opened and I, I just thought, oh good, you know, so. Wonderful. Because <laughs> I'm really doing it now messily and badly. So I need, I need to, I need to get some guidance. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Janet. Well, yeah. um, let's, let's move on now. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to um, look at a few um, slides. So let me know that you can see this slide. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're looking, as you know, at point of view. And what is point of view? What are we really talking about when we say narrative point of view? Well, it's really about what is the perspective of the narrator who is telling the story? 
through whose eyes or through what lens is the story being told? And for memoir, um, it might well be through your eyes as a child, perhaps, growing up from when you were five, six. It might be chronologically through those years, as you were saying, Janet, you, you were looking chronologically at, at your life, or perhaps um, through the perspective as an adult looking back at your life. Or you might well decide to use both, both the child point of view and the adult and combine the two. Um, in memoir, when we're narrating a story from our own experiences, it's likely that we will use the first person. So the first person point of view using the pronoun I. I woke up this morning to the sound of birds. Um, we're going to look at three extracts and three different points of view now. Um, the first is by a writer called Seamus Dean, who was born in 1940. Um, he is an essayist, a novelist, a poet, um, and his first novel, which is called Reading in the Dark, was published in 1966 and it won the Guardian Fiction Prize and several other prestigious awards for literature, including it was shortlisted for uh, the Booker Prize in 1966. Now the book is set in Derry in Northern Ireland and it's, it's set between 1945 and 1971 and it's told from the point of view of a young unnamed Irish Catholic boy who's growing up in Derry and it's a coming of age story. It's about the troubles in Northern Ireland. And the tone of the book is, is really special because although it's about a very challenging time and environment, it manages to maintain a sense of real hope and humour um, and freedom in the writing. Um, the chapters are divided, they're subdivided into very short episodes, short stories, and they've each got lovely names like feet and mother, father, blood, um, and they're very evocative. Um, now, this was published as a novel, interestingly, but actually Seamus Dean has often been asked why it was published as a novel and not a memoir. And he rather avoids this question um, because a lot of his upbringing is identical to the protagonist in this book. Um, but it really does raise the question of, of how much of truth lies in fiction when fiction is, is published. What I'd like to do now is to read sections of this and there's quite a lot to be read. So I wonder if maybe um, there could be two readers who would be willing to read. So someone read this first page and, and somebody else read the second two pages. Give me a, a hand up if you're willing to read. Read? Yes, Tessa, that would be fantastic. Anybody else? Um, I, I can, let me, can yeah. I see? Yes, oh, um, Janet, is that you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So should we start um, Janet, should we start with you and you do this, yes. this page and then uh, we'll move on to, to Tessa. Okay, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the volume of my voice about right for everybody? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I can perfectly, Janet, yeah. Okay, so this is Feet, September 1948. The plastic tablecloth hung so far down that I could only see their feet, but I could hear the noise and some of the talk, although I was so crunched up that I could make out very little of what they were saying. Besides, our collie dog, Smokey, was whimpering. Every time he quivered under his fur, I became deaf to their words and alert to their noise. Smokey had found me under the table when the room filled with feet, standing at all angles. Is that right? Oh, when the room filled with feet, standing at all angles, and he sloped through them and came to huddle himself on me. He felt the dread too. Una, my younger sister, Una. She was going to die after they took her to the hospital. I could hear the clumping of the feet of the ambulance men as they tried to manoeuvre her on a stretcher down the stairs. They would have to lift it high over the banister 
the turn was too narrow. I had seen the red handles of the stretcher when the glossy shoes of the ambulance men appeared in the centre of the room. One had been holding it, folded up, perpendicular, with the handles on the ground beside his shiny black shoes, which had a tiny redness in one toe cap when he put the stretcher handles onto the linoleum. The lino itself was so polished that there were answering rednesses in it too, buried upside down under the surface. That morning, Una had been so hot that, pale and sweaty as she was, she had made me think of sunken fires like these. Her eyes shone with pain and pressure, inflated from the inside. This was a new illness. I loved the names of the others, diphtheria, scarlet fever or scarlatina, rubella, polio, influenza. They made me think of Italian football players or racing drivers or opera singers. Each had its own smell, especially diphtheria the disinfected sheets that hung over the bedroom. So are you do happy I... to carry on? Um, yes, where should I um, stop? No, T Tess, are you happy to carry on? Yeah, I was gonna say. Yes, it starts in the middle of a sentence though. You've got oh, yeah. to pause, is it? Shall yeah. I? Yeah. Um, out their acrid fragrances in the draughts that chilled your ankles on the stairs. Am I right? The yeah, mum yep, yep. came after the diphtheria. It wasn't frightening. It couldn't be. The word was funny and everybody's face was swollen and looked as if it had been in a, in a terrific fight. But this was a new sickness, meningitis. It was a word you had to bite on to say it. It had a fright and a hiss in it. And when I said it, I could feel Una's eyes widening all the time and getting lighter, as if helium were pumping into them from her brain. They would burst, I thought, unless they could find a way of getting all that pure helium pain out. They were at the bottom of the stairs. All the feet moved that way. I could see my mother's brothers were there. I recognised Uncle Manus's brown shoes. The heels were worn down and he was moving back and forward a little. Uncle Dan and Uncle Tom had identical shoes, heavy and rimmed with mud and content, and cement, sorry, because they had come from the building site in Cregan. Dan's were dirtier though, because Tom was the foreman. But they weren't good shoes. Dan put one up, one knee up on a chair. There was scaffold oil on his socks. He must have been dipping putlocks in oil. Once he invited me to reach into the bucket to find a lock that had slipped to the bottom. And when I drew it out, black to the upper muscle, the slick oil swarmed down my skin to corrugate on my wrist. I sprinkled handfuls of sawdust on it, turning my arm into a bright oatmeal sleeve that darkened before Dan made me wash it off. But it was my mother's and father's feet I watched the most. She was wearing low heels that needed mending and her feet were always swollen so that even from there, I could see the shoe leather embedded, vanishing from that angle into her ankles. There was more scuffle and noise, and her feet disappeared in, into the hallway after the stretcher, and she was cough-crying at my father's work boots, followed close behind her, huge with laces thonged round the back. Then everybody was out, and the room was empty. Smokey shook under his fur and whimpered when I pushed him away. It was cold, with all the doors open. Sorry, I can't see the end of the page. Oh, ah, I've got the pictures up there. Could oh. somebody else take over? I, Who can? I, can? I can take over if you like. Thank you. Thank you. It was cold, with all the doors open and the autumn air darkening. Una was going to die. She was only five, younger than me. I tried to imagine her not there. She would go to heaven for sure. Wouldn't she miss us? What could you do in heaven except smile? 
She had a great smile. Everyone came in again. There wasn't much talking. My father stood near the table. I could smell the quayside on his dungarees, the aroma of horizons where ships grew to a speck and disappeared. Every day he went to work as an electrician's mate at the British naval base. I felt he was, I felt he was going out foreign, as we said about anyone who went abroad, and every day he came back. I was relieved that he had changed his mind. Tom was pushing a spirit level into a long leg pocket of his American boiler suit. Where would the little eye bubble of the spirit level go now? Disappear into the wooden end? Go right off the little marked circle where it truly belonged? The circle would be big and empty. Dan picked up his coat, which had fallen off a chair and onto the floor. I could see the dermatitis stains on his fingers and knuckles. He was allergic to the plaster he had to work with on the building site every day. Next month he'd be off work, his hand all scabs and sores. But Una would be long dead by then. They all left except my parents. My father was at the table again. My mother was standing at the kitchen press a couple of feet away, her shoes tight together looking very small. She was still crying. My father's boots moved towards her until they were very close. He was saying something. Then he moved yet closer, almost stood on her shoes, which moved apart. One of his boots was between her feet. There was her shoe, then his boot, then her shoe, then his boot. I looked at Smokey, who licked my face. He was kissing her. She was crying. Their feet shifted and I thought she was going to fall one shoe came off the ground for a second then they stood steadied and just stood there everything was silent and i scarcely breathed smoky crept out to sit at the fire thank you thanks for everyone for reading that um okay so thinking about this from the perspective of point of view how does this writing give us an insight into this young boy's life well immediately it it, it it points to his size and the difference between you know that he is very small because yeah you see the feet so that that that's that's nice and then he's at the same level as the dogs yeah stretches and the grown-ups are higher up so that's yeah. a viewpoint so we get Absolutely, the, everything, the, the, the perspective, the scale of um, seeing shoes and the toe caps of the ambulance men particularly, we get a sense of scale and size. Um, how are the senses used as well in this piece? Mm, beautifully. I think oh, all of them, apart from taste, I think are, are mentioned. It's lovely. Mm, it incredible. gives such a vivid picture of what he's seeing and how he's perceiving it, it's lovely. What did you, what really sp sprung out at you specifically? Well, the lots of it, the, the smells of the, the illnesses or the smells he associated with the different illnesses, that's very, very vivid. Um, and also um, the uh, guy that got oil on his arm, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, his descriptions are just really lovely. Yeah, and, and the sort of sense of wonder, wonderment, where would the little eye bubble of the spirit level go now? That kind of thing. It's Absolutely. Fantastic. So we're seeing it, even though it, it's, it's adult language, the vocabulary is, is really, you know, um, it's certainly not childlike language. We're seeing it from, from um, the, the point of view of a child, but it's told through the vocabulary of, of adult language. Otherwise it would be too basic. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, this is why we're thinking about the lens is the, the, the little boy's lens or the little boy's eyes, but we're getting the, the expansiveness of the vocabulary, those wonderful motifs and images mm -hmm. and use of senses through, through the language. Um, yeah. I think it's amazing, um, so it's not a very good word to use, I think the way that he um, uses the shoes um, to describe the characters, I mean we haven't seen anything above foot level, well you know boot level, but we know these people because we've got their characters already just from his you know um, detailed sort of minutiae of, of, the, of the shoes 
because it gives away their occupations. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And the very moving image of his mother and father's feet, yeah. one foot, the other foot, the other foot, and then the foot coming off the ground. So, you know, the, the cringing intimacy. Yeah. 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 Um, absolutely. Yeah. So it, it here, this, this piece is really evocative because of its richness in use of senses, but also particularly because of the point of view, it's all done from low down and we just see these, these feet. Um, yet it's so strong and we can almost smell it, touch it, taste it from, from the vocabulary that he's using. Um, and, and also the imagination of, um, you know, what meningitis might mean and then interpreting his, the bulging eyes and the helium popping out. And yeah, absolutely. So we, this, this no, boy's no. imagination, you're right. Yeah. Um, and he's very, he extends um, the metaphor. I mean, the use, you know, just the, the colour, the, the red in the first bit that I read, you know, red is, is all stretched out because obviously it's symbolic of blood and death. He, he sees the red reflected even in the, the shininess, you know, of the linoleum. Yeah. So, he, yeah. And, and yeah, through the ambulances, men's shoes, yep. toe caps. Yeah. Okay, let's now, um, I mean, we could talk and talk and talk about this because yeah. it's so wonderful. And I really urge you to, to read, um, you know, read the book. But let's move on now um, to another writer, uh, Doris Lessing, who I'm sure a lot of you uh, would have known, if not read, um, some of her work already. Um, so Doris Lessing, at the age of 88, received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And throughout her time as a writer, she has written um, novels, short stories, biographies, libretto, drama, poetry, I mean, you name it, she's done all of it. Um, she also was a very strong activist, um, a feminist and anti-racist. She was born in Iran in 1919, and she then moved to Rhodesia, which is now uh, Zimbabwe, where she went to school until she was 13 years old. Um, she was then self-educated from then on. And at 15, she left home and she worked as a nursemaid. And it was around this time at 15 years old that she started to write. Um, her body of work has gained international recognition, but particularly for her novel, The Golden Notebook. But we're going to look at her um, autobiography today, Under, Under My Skin. It was first published in 1994. Um, it was the first volume of her autobiography, and it was covering her birth in 1919 to 1949, when she left southern Rhodesia. Let's have a look then at this section. Is someone else willing to read just between those two, where the two pencil markings are, a shorter piece? Lovely, thanks. It's Alex, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not as good as an eraser, but... <laughs> Don't okay. worry at all. It's just great to ha hear different voices read. Um, so yeah, when you're ready. A tiny thing among trampling, knocking careless giants who smell, who lean down towards you with great ugly hairy faces showing big dirty teeth. A foot you keep an eye on while trying to watch all the other dangers as well is almost as big as you are. The hands they use to grip you can squeeze the breath half out of you. The rooms you run about in, the furniture you move among, windows, doors are vast, nothing is your size, but one day you will grow tall enough to reach the handle of the door or the knob on a cupboard. These are the real childhood memories and any have you, and the any have you level with grown-ups are later inventions. An intense physicality, that is the truth of childhood. My first memory is before I was two, and it is of an enormous dangerous horse towering up, up, and on it my father still higher, his head and shoulders somewhere in the sky. 
There he sits with his wooden leg, always there under his trousers, a big, hard, slippery, hidden thing. I am trying not to cry while being lifted up in tight, squeezing hands and put in front of my father's body, told to grip this in front of the saddle, told to grip the front of the saddle, a hard jutting edge I must stretch my fingers to hold. I am inside the heat of a horse, the smell of a horse, the smell of my father, all hot, pungent smells. When the horse moves, it is a jerking, jolting motion, and I lean back my head and shoulders into my father's stomach and feel there are hard straps of the wooden leg hardness. My stomach is reeling because of the sweep up from the ground now so far below me. Now, that is a real memory. Violent, smelly, physical. Lovely. Thanks, Alec. Really nicely read. Um, yes, yeah, so we're seeing this childhood from an adult's perspective, looking back at from her memory. She's interested in the truth, isn't she? She's not interested in later inventions. As she says, now that's a real memory, violent, smelly, physical. I wonder what, what you think about using memory in this way. Does it, does it strike anyone? How different is this to the other piece? Well, the other person was a, a spectator with this person. All the senses are at, she, you know, she's surrounded and squeezed and overwhelmed by physicality. So she's not so much an observer as that she's very much a kind of um, unwilling participant, I would mm. say. Mm. Yeah, being lifted up onto the horse. We still get a sense of scale in this as well, don't we? Mm. Because she's lifted high up onto the horse. Her father there the father's wooden leg which you you get again a real the, the senses play a strong part particularly in the smell um you can imagine that wooden leg being very sort of hard and slippery um so with memory we the senses are a really strong evocative um and important part of writing what other things strike you from f about this Sorry, I can't see everyone. The, the tense and the immediacy of it, that it's in the present tense. And, uh, yes. You're aware that, um, you know, because it's in the past, it might be something that she doesn't remember quite so well, but I think to make it more vivid, um, put it in the present tense. Mm. So she slips it in, doesn't she, into the present tense. Mm. Uh, very cleverly, it, it's... Um, she talks about memory being, you know, anything that's, that you, you're, you're embellishing and making a sort of a story out of isn't true memoir. She's saying actually, you know, just these violent physical thoughts and sensations are more true. Um, yes. Anything else about this piece? It's just a short section, but I think it's a, an interesting slant and a very true slant on how memoir can be written, that it, that it can be very um, fragmented, actually. The way we remember things, we don't remember things in fully formed sentences and fully formed stories. Actually, quite often our thoughts and our memories are very disjointed. It might be a photograph we remember and then the memory comes later or uh and and, and how we remember is also quite interesting mm. um, she's almost uh pulling up her memory and just just almost sort of just scrolling it down she's remembering and sort of painting the picture as she goes and actually that is definitely yeah a much more real well that's how memories come to us it'll often be as you say sort of jolted by something and actually you almost feel it coming back to her i can certainly feel her sort of rocking on the horse and uh feel how, exactly how she would feel so no it's, it's an interesting take yeah yes you're right it First, sort of escalates doesn't it as as she goes along yeah more and more vivid yes very intense and very physical and she she repeats i mean there's a lot of smell and pungency in it she uses the sense of smell a lot i think you know and how it must feel 
Yes. Um, but I sp and also, you know, as a child, the senses are heightened because magical. thoughts are bigger, smells are bigger. Our smells and senses sort of get numbed, don't they, really, yeah. as we get older. Mm -hmm. But to a very small child, I mean, it seems as if she was almost a baby, things are doubly big. It, it literally in, sky, in size, but also um, through senses. Great. Okay, let's let's move on now um, to Nausgaard. Um, sorry, I'm just moving my iPad up. So Carl Ove Nausgaard um, is a Norwegian writer, and he's mainly known for his work My Struggle, which is um, a series of six autobiographical novels written between 2009 and 2011. And the books really cover Nausgaard's private life and his thoughts. And when they were published, there was a real media uproar. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, journalists were tracking down members of his family, I think, and he sold over half a million coffee, co uh, copies in Norway alone. So it was a huge success. And I'm just going to read a little bit about how he came to write it. Um, when after 10 years of trying, I sat down one day and wrote a few pages about something that had happened to me, something I felt so ashamed about. I had never mentioned it to a living soul and did so using my own name. I had no idea why I went there nor did I, to begin with, connect it with any way to the novel that I wanted to write. It was just something I did. I sent it to my editor, who described it as manically confessional, and I got the impression that he took a step back, so to speak, because it was so disconcerting and not good in a literary sense. But there was something there, nonetheless, and both he and I saw it. What was it? <laughs> First, firstly, there was freedom. If I went in that direction, simply writing down things I had experienced, using my own name, it was as if all concerns about style, form, literary device, character, tone, distance, at once ceased to exist, and the vestments of literature suddenly became unnecessary posturing. All I had to do was write. What do I have that could possibly make another person want to spend time and effort reading about it? Who would want to know that I had stood and pissed up against a pile of snow while listening to the talking heads on a Walkman one night in the 1980s? I started with something that happened when I was 16. I was going to a New Year's Eve party with a friend. While at the time I had no idea what I was writing or why, it is abundantly clear to me now. I was writing about life the way it appears to an uninformed 16 year old in all its enormous banality. And only when I had done so was it possible for me to write about my father's demise, about death in all its enormous banality. So those are his thoughts in terms of how he started writing My Struggle. He, he just started. I mean, you know, it was, he was, he was, he felt a sense of freedom. And I really think that you were saying, I think Janet, you know, if we, if we set a time each day and worry less about it being a literary piece of work or, or very good, if we can actually trust ourselves that our memories, that our um, senses, that our stories as human beings are actually, you know, they're worth reading, they're worth writing down, however small they are, however banal they are, um, because it's about the human condition. And that really does mean going into the detail though. Um, yeah, so any thoughts on, on this, uh, this, this bit of reading that I've just done? I think the question, you know, the uh, beginning, oh, sorry, uh, Tessa, the, the way that we're, you know, we're dying to know what he's going to tell us about, and then mentions something fairly trite, and then clearly it's going to, you know, 
um, change into something much more, um, you know, life affecting, which is the death of his father. Yeah. Yes. It's giving ourselves permission to allow our stories to, to evolve. Because often we don't give ourselves permission. We think, oh, it's not interesting enough. But actually, starting with those small stories can actually lead to much bigger and huge questions in life. Um, it's and allowing yourself the allowing your instincts to come through. I think through writing. Um, Some of the references to his age where it began at sixteen years old. It's almost like uh, that's a point when. Most of us are innocent in many ways, mm -hmm. and something obviously happens to perhaps take away that, well, innocent. become more enlightened through life. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what intrigues us to see more about it, to read more about it. Yeah. What happens to him? Yes. Yeah. It's a, a very uh, evocative age, 16, isn't it? Um, and, we, and we will see that. Let, let's read some of it now so we can um, reference it. Um, is anyone willing to read uh, a few pages of this? I could read a page or two. Yes, lovely. Is that, sorry, Patricia? Yeah, so we yes, can end. fantastic. Um, anybody else? Oh, I'm happy to read as well. Anybody else? I need a different spectacles. Um, so I'm actually no a little bit different to read. Don't worry. The text, I'm um, sorry. Um, <laughs> that's fine. So Patricia, do you want to read the um, first couple of pages and, and I'll read the, the last one. Are you okay. happy to do that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. When you're ready. Right. Some minutes, so start again. Some minutes later, we were standing outside the house. It was a 70s build and looks a bit run down. The snow on the path to the front door had not been cleared, not for a long time, judging by the line of knee-deep tracks that wound towards the house. What was his name, the boy whose party this is? I asked as we stood by the door. I think it's Jan, Jan Ronnie, Jan Vida said and rang the bell. Jan Ronnie, I repeated, it could be Jan, sorry, but that's his name. The door opened. It must have been the host standing in front of us. He had short blonde hair, pimples on his cheeks, and around the top of his nose wore a gold chain round his neck, black jeans, a cotton lumberjack lumber shirt, and white tennis so socks. He smiled and pointed at Jan Vida's stomach. Jan Vida, he said. Right first time, Jan Vida said. And you are, he said, brandishing his finger at me. Kai, Olaf. Carl over, I said. What the fuck? Come on in. We've already started. We took off our outdoor clothes in the hall and followed him downstairs to a cellar room where there were five people watching TV. The table in front of them was covered with beer bottles, crisp bowls, packs of cigarettes and tobacco pouches. Ovind, who was sitting on the sofa with his arms round his girlfriend Lenny, only in the seventh class, but still great and so forward, you never thought about the age difference, smiled at us as we went in. Hi there, Oivin said. Great, you could make it, he introduced the others. Rune, Jens and Ellen. Rune was in the ninth class, Jens and Ellen were in the eighth, while Jan Ronnie, who was Oivin's cousin, was at technical school. Uh, a budding mechanic. None of them had dressed up, not so much as a white shirt. What are you watching? Jan Vida asked, sitting on the sofa and taking out a beer. I leaned against the wall under the low cellar window, which was completely covered by the snow on the outside. A Bruce Lee film, Ovind replied. It's almost over, but we've got bachelor party as well, and a Dirty Harry film, and Jan Ronnie's got a few of his own. What would you like to see? We're easy. Jan Vida shrugged. I'm easy. What do you say, Carl Ove? Over. I shrugged. Is there a bottle opener around? I asked. Oven bent forward and took a lighter from the table, chucked it over to me, but I couldn't open bottles with lighter, nor could I ask Jan Vida to open the bottle for me. That was too homo. I took a bottle from the bag and put the top between my teeth, twisted it so the cap was right over a molar and bit. The cap came off with a hiss. 
Don't do that, said Lenny. It's fine, I said. I downed the beer in one gulp, apart from all the carbon dioxide filling my stomach with air, which meant I had to swallow the tiny belches that came up. I still didn't feel anything and I couldn't manage another beer in one go. My feet ached as their warmth began to return. Anyone got any spirits? I asked. They shook their heads. Just beer, I'm afraid, Ovid said. But you can have one of you can have one if you want. Already got some, thanks, I said. Ovind raised his bottle. Jink and sink, he says. Jink and sink, the others said, touching bottles, and they laughed. I fished out the packet of cigarettes from the bag and lit up. Pal mal mild, not exactly the coolest cigarette around, and standing there with the all-white cigarette in my hand. The filter was white too. I regretted having not bought prints, but my mind had been focused on the party we were go going to after 12. The one that Irene from the class was throwing and Pall Mall Mild would not be too conspicuous there. It was also the brand that Narv smoked. At least it had been the one time I had seen him smoking, one evening in the garden when mum and dad had been at Alf's dad's uncle. Time for another bottle. I didn't want to use my teeth again. Something told me that sooner or later I would come a cropper. Sooner or later the molar would give way and break. And now that I had shown that I could open bottles with my teeth, perhaps I wouldn't seem so homo to let Jan Vidar open it for me. I went over to him, nabbed a few crisps from the bowl on the table. Can you open this for me? He nodded without taking his eyes off the film. Over the last year, he'd been doing, doing kickboxing I kept forgetting, was just as surprised every time he invited me to a session or to some such thing. Of course, I always refused. But this was Bruce Lee, the fighting was the whole point, and he had one foot in the door. With a beer bottle in my hand, I went back to my place by the wall. No one said anything. Ovin looked at me. Take the weight off your feet, Carl Ove, he said. I'm fine standing, I said. Well, skull anyway, he said raising the bottle to mine. I took two cases over to him and we clinked. So we get a real point of view of a young teenage boy in this, wanting to seem cool. Well, what, what do you think? What do you get from, from this piece? I can um, feel the teenage awkwardness just as you were reading. <laughs> you can relate to that. that age and the way he sort of describes all these things, it's just, you can always, yeah, you can feel his slight uncomfortable sort of, oh gosh, is this going to fit in? I just think he paints it really vividly. Um, he does. The various yeah. sort of awkwardnesses and um, yeah, so it, it takes me back to that age. Um, very uncomfortably. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he, he's really putting on a bit of an, of an act, isn't it? Isn't mm. but, but the language and the story is actually very simple. You know, the, these little small moments of arriving at this house, of going down to the basement, you know, the television is on, there's only five people there. He paints a picture of a very, <laughs> dull scene you know but yeah. it's evocative because we can relate to him wanting it to be more mm. um what else do you notice or like yes janet um well oh yeah because um what i was thinking was it's i'm trying not to compare it to the others but i am it's it's yeah. much less rich and much less physical it is you know the the, the language is stark but he uses dialogue, I think, far more to show, you know, to show the characters. But I, I think what I get mainly from this is he's desperate to impress so much so that he will use his teeth to open his beer bottle rather than risk asking the coolest guy in the room, you know, if he can have a, a wimpy um, bottle opener. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. And you're right about using dialogue this brings a different quality and a really important quality. It brings it to life because we, we hear the voices of these other characters rather than with mm. the first uh, piece, Reading in the Dark, you know, nothing was said by other people. We were seeing it only through and hearing it only through the little, very small young boy's eyes. But here we get a richer sense of the other characters. Um, 
Yes. What, what, what would other people think of this piece? Anything else to add to this? I think there's a comparison to the sort of person, the, um, the, the main, um, who he is, by the dialogue between the others. And when he's reflecting that they're not dressed for the occasion yeah. and he's worried about, he's not stupid, he knows his teeth might come undone, so he takes care of himself. So mm -hmm. to me, there's a comparison on his character and, you know, perhaps he's more interesting. So you get, I think it gets a sense of that. That's why he's writing his, you know, you want to know more about him because he's mixing with quite insipid teenagers trying to prove themselves. Yeah. And, you know, like one is just his eyes on the TV. The girl is very young, but she's quite promiscuous by the sound of it, growing up for her age, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And you, you, there's, if you read the whole of this section, there's a real slow build for this New Year's Eve party. It takes a long time, but mm -hmm. by the end of it, you're really on tender hooks as to know, is he going to meet Irene mm -hmm. and what's going to happen, you know, between them. Um, and, and, and it's, a, it's very clever because it's this big build, but not much actually does happen. Um, but it gets a real sense of that anticipation when you're a teenager of going out on New Year's Eve and it's going to be this big night and they take beer bottles with them and they keep having to hide it because their dads and their mums are driving past. <laughs> um, so lovely humour but also sort of bringing out lovely detail in quite banal um, situations. Any other thoughts um, before we're going to have a have a break now, actually? But any thoughts before we do that? And I like the way it builds the tension more so, perhaps, than the other two. It, it makes you want, want to read on. I think. Yeah. Very much know this one. You know, it's a trail. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Well, why do you think that is? You said it builds the tension. Is that is that? What, can you be a bit more specific about what you mean, Janet? Well, um, as you say, it's quite it's quite uneventful, really. It's just description, um, but then we get small clues um, dropped in about you know the, the real party he wants to be in, where his 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 uh, rather boring cigarette won't be too conspicuous there. So uh, it, it keeps dropping clues in. I think you know a bit like a breadcrumbs trail in advance that will make us want to read on, which yeah. I think is clever. A really good point Janet is is like leaving a trail breadcrumb trail yeah. really nice in terms of giving us the anticipation of what's to come and that keeps us wanting more um, and a really useful tool to have motifs woven into the piece yes. mm. that, that we will draw on or realize later on so you're keeping your audience or your readers interested and excited um, great Okay, so we're going to have a have a break. And what I suggest is that if you, I mean, you don't have to have a break, but I suggest that you sort of turn, put yourself on mute and turn your camera off if you want to, or just walk away. And that we'll take, you know, five, 10 minutes here. Um, I'll, I'll be back in five minutes, so I won't, I'm not going far, but um, we'll just have a quick break for anyone that wants to, and then, start again when everyone's back okay okay, okay thank yep. you we'll see you shortly carry on um we're going to look at some top tips for writing uh memoir and then we'll do some writing exercises so yeah so here are a few five top tips um, which we'll discuss now. Um, so the first is quite an obvious one maybe, but it's something that we really need to think about, which is to grab the, the attention of the reader from, from the very beginning, from the off. Of course, you can't hit us with everything all at once. You can't suddenly, you know, <laughs> amalgamate everything into the first episode. Um, but neither do you need to start with some major event at the beginning in the, in the central narrative. You just need something that will draw us in. And um, it could be, as I've been saying before, something quite small, something quite banal, but it needs to have a strong voice. So establish a strong voice from the, from the off 
and hint at what lies ahead. A bit like what we saw in Nausgaard's writing where he was dropping in hints for what's about to come. Drop those in so we anticipate and we want to learn more about um, the rest of the book. Um, any questions on that at all? So the second one is about dramatizing yourself as the narrator. So often it's quite helpful to think about memoir as fiction, in fact, or your story as fiction, to sort of stand back from it and be objective. Also to think that this is your story, this is, you know, this is your life, your family, um, and it's important to you. So don't sort of, don't give us a blank piece of paper, nor be too prim and perfect about it, you know. We want to see the messiness, we want to see the details. If you're, if you're too prim and too perfect in, in your writing, it'll annoy us. So let's see, you know, let's see the truth behind it. Um, in terms of dramatizing yourself as the narrator, when there's a very intense, you know, scene or episode in your, in your narrative, don't suddenly go missing as the narrator. Make sure that your present, your voice of the narrator is, is there throughout. When you're writing memoir, you don't need to be overly confessional. Um, you know, you might be quite a shy person by nature, but you should let us get to know you a little bit because even though this is your story, you're still a character in your own memoir, if that makes sense. The third point is put us there. And we've certainly seen that in the pieces that we've read today. And by that, I mean, you know, let us see, hear, taste, smell, you know, all use all of the senses and let us really relive the experience that you went through. Um, and dialogue is, is much better to use than reported speech. Um, so whatever the episode, if it's vivid to you, um, then it's going to be vivid, make it vivid to us. You wouldn't have chosen this episode to write about that unless it was important. So make it, bring it to life for us by putting us there using dialogue. The fourth one is be strict about point of view. If you're writing from the point of view of you as a child, make sure you create a voice that sounds like a child, you know, in, in tone, if not vocabulary, as we saw in the first piece, Reading in the Dark. It's not that you need, you know, childish language, you just need the tone through the eyes and the lens of the child um, that we can feel, yeah, this is convincing. So create a voice that's convincing in tone, if not vocabulary. And finally, um, choose a tense carefully. And this is where I think you can all experiment with tense. Using the present tense really creates immediacy. Um, but the trouble with immediacy, it can also inhibit and create a sort of measure, uh, you know, inhibit a measured reflection. You can't stand back from it because it's all in the present now. The past tense um, is the more obvious choice, obviously, for memoirs, but that can also seem a bit too tidy and a bit too sort of sedate, if you like. You may decide to use both. You know, I, I'm certainly using both in mine, um, but make sure that you're consistent. You know, don't flip and change too regularly. Make sure you're, if you're in one, you stay in one and then you swap to the other. Um, if you're inconsistent, the reader's going to get confused. Any thoughts about those, um, those points there or questions that you might have? I yes. find it's a bit difficult um, when you say don't switch. Sometimes yeah. you know, when I'm writing, I find myself switching. Yeah. That. 
realizing it without realizing it, absolutely I, I i can fully appreciate that and i think it's sort of really honing down and being really scrutinizing and knowing okay three really put the lenses on almost put the glasses on from whose eyes am i seeing this from from what perspective and give yourself uh, be rigorous about that because yes it can be very very easy to dance between the two and get confused um sometimes you know it's helpful to go all the way through from one a tense you know from the present tense so go all the way through from the past tense and then if you want to chop and change you can do it more easily um, are there any specific rules especially when you've got um, dialogue or you know someone else's perspective that uh, just I mean I, I not, there aren't specific rules that I can can explain easily no I think it's and, and you know rules are it's got to make sense you know obviously and rules are fine but rules are also there they can also be broken um, and you've got to make it true for you um, so yes I would just as I say be maybe first of all separate it out into one tense and then the other and then amalgamate it when you're ready um, but no, no set rules, I'm afraid. Um, any other questions on any of those points? Yes, Janet. Uh, yes, um, this is why I'm very glad I'm doing this course now. I'm only 6,000 into my, no, I really, I haven't used any dialogue at all, none whatsoever. Um, so, but I know from the three bits that we've been um, reading. So, I mean, it's not too late. Um, no. I, what you're actually saying is that, um, dialogue is is um, draws the reader more in than reported speech yeah. it does it does because it keeps the narrative it keeps us alive it keeps um, it. yes it keeps us sort of the momentum moving forward yeah it, it we can it can get quite sleepy if it's all in um you know narration so try it you know in the, we're, we're going to move on to some writing exercises now janet so i really okay encourage you to just give it a go okay um, and um try it out um and often you know a way in is maybe a way in is not to put dialogue in first i know for my you know you just need to write it and then come back to it and yeah. rewrite it with dialogue and that's just you know, that's absolutely fine any other thoughts Okay, let's do a writing exercise then. Um, we're going to look um, for our first writing e exercise at the child's point of view. So I want you to write an episode um, from your own life, from you, from the perspective of you as a child. It can be any age, but sometime in your childhood. And I want you to really put us there so drawing on all the texts that we've looked at today, really be specific about the setting, where you are, your environment, the senses, what does it feel like, what's the heat, the smell, uh, can you taste anything, what do you see around you? Go through all of the senses if you can. And I want you to do it in the, in the first person, so I, I, pull, I pulled on my favorite sweatshirt with dash written across the front and use the present tense. So I pull on, I pull on my sweatshirt rather than I pulled on my sweatshirt, okay? And I'll give you sort of 10 minutes for this um, or maybe eight minutes actually. Really also think about how exposed are we to your thoughts and feelings? So what I mean by that is how honest are you being with us? Are you telling us the whole story in this episode or are you holding something back which will be revealed later? So, you know, are you dropping in clues about something that might arrive later or are we getting the whole, the full truthful episode? 
Is that clear? So writing from the point of view of you as a child in the first person in the present tense. And I'll give you, yeah, eight minutes or so to write that. Is everyone ready to go? Okay, off you go then. Okay, so just finishing up now. You can always come back to it later. Um, okay, how did you get on before we move on to the next one? How, how was that? Let, let me hear how, Janet, you're nodding your head. Did you all manage <laughs> yeah. to write anyway? Yeah, it did actually. Yes, it was, it was quite good. At, um, yeah, I kind of felt, um, probably because we've had all that lovely stimulus from those three stories, I was, you know, quite, quite, uh, it was it was quite easy it was kind of like pouring out really it was probably absolute rubbish but don't worry we, we won't hear them just yet until that we're going to do another exercise we will hear some of them hmm. other people how how did you get on yeah it was nice yeah enjoyable i found it flowed easily actually it was mm. good good to do what, what was what flowed easily for you um well at first i said oh gosh what am I going to write about? And then I just thought of something, a journey that I'd done several times as a child. And I just found it very easy to, to do. And as I wrote, it became easier, um, you know, thinking of how it actually felt and the senses thing, you know, the things I could smell and taste and see and hear. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was lovely. Good to start. Good. Good. Anybody else? Anybody get stuck or find it incredibly difficult? Oh. I just enjoyed the instructions because you were very precise. You told us what we should write and almost set us up in, in the, on that path. Yeah. Yes, having clear boundaries sometimes is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, when you've got, you just, oh, write anything. It, it can be sort of actually a bit you know you can get a bit struck by oh i don't know where to start so yeah having some boundaries is is quite helpful i think okay well we will hear these but i want us to write a second exercise now but this time i want you to start from the point of view as you as an adult looking back at your life um, now this can be any episode in your life, you as an adult writing about an adult time or you as an adult looking back at your childhood. Um, of course, this is going to have a reflective quality about it. So I want you to use the past tense. So I pulled on my favourite sweatshirt with dash written across the front. You know, my mum and dad had brought me the sweatshirt from Bristol Hippodrome. Um, so make sure you're consistent, again, using the past tense, but it's from the point of view of you as an adult looking back. You could decide to write the episode that you've just written as from an adult's point of view, if you wanted to, or an entirely different episode. That's up to you. I'll give you the same amount of time, about eight, nine minutes, and then we'll share some of them. Is everyone clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's go then. Okay, so let's finish off there. And let's hear how you all got on with that. How was that in comparison to writing from the child point of view? How was it from the adult perspective? Harder. <laughs> harder. Yeah. I would agree, harder. Yeah. yeah. Do you think what was it that made it harder? Do you think harder to stand back, and also I think I'm much more boring as an adult than I am as a child. Just <laughs> more boring. <laughs> I don't feel very interesting as an adult. <laughs> and harder to stand back. You were saying to be objective. Yeah. Well, not for me because I'm really old. But I mean, the, the bit I did was ages ago. But it is the nearer it gets to now, the harder it is to look at it. I'm never sure whether it's subjectively or subjectively, but whichever one it is. Yes. Yeah. Is anyone willing to, to share either piece, the, the first 
childhood piece or, or the adult perspective? It'd be lovely to hear from... Right. Okay. Janet, which one are you going to do? Um, I'll do the childhood one. It might be a bit long and I'm looking at the time, so I'll just do a bit of it and you can sort of... Yeah, do, it, do a bit of it, because it would yeah. be nice to hear from everyone. So this is the present tense one, yeah. Monday evening, which means it's swimming, our swimming lesson. We bike there on our red and blue Raleigh bicycles, rewards for passing our 11 plus. The whiff, the stench of municipal chlorine hits my nostrils as we turn into the small lane where the baths are. Starbeck baths, stone built, Victorian, the pool of pea soup or choppy water. The dread of the foot bath you have to, to run through before you reach the pool. But before we can reach the pool and the can't read that. Oh, this the d doubtful delights of our swimming lesson with Mrs. Sinkinson. We have to pass them. I hope pathetically they might not be there on this bright June evening, but they are. A row of local girls line the wall each side of the drive up to the baths. They are like waiting vultures, aware of our vulnerability, our strangeness, the way we look alike, twins. The leader stands up on the wall, her thin, scrawny legs stretching up from pink plastic sandals. Her dress dances on her thin body as she waves her arms. Tatty heads, she says. Hey, tatty heads. That's what they called us, tatty heads. We ride on bravely. They don't actually touch us, but their words hurt, brand us. We reach the safety of the porch and lock our bikes up, escape inside, breathe in the chlorine. But even as the swimming pool world engulfs me like a watery uterus, the dread of leaving, st leaving stabs my heart. They will be there when we come out. <laughs> done it. Fantastic. Some amazing yeah. images. Yes, well, others, what, 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 what do you think of what Janet has written there? Share your, your thoughts. There's just terrific. I mean, terrific, the foot bath and the, yeah. the, the sort of, yeah, some of those really strong images. Yeah, I, I went a bit the, the tense actually with the foot bath, there's a slight blip there, but I can put that right, but yeah, anyway. Others, others thoughts, what, what did you think? Yeah, we could be there. It's like we were in, you know, we were actually observing it and watching it. It was very sort of, uh, you know, you could literally just as if you were an observer of what was going on there. Yeah. And the smell of the chlorine was so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was really strong then. It was proper chlorine, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah, because I, I dread to think... Um, of the germs that were in those baths because they were very old and a lot of kids used it so I think they just drowned out the bugs with very which chlorine is so strong it nearly pickled you so it was death by chlorine or death by bug you know <laughs> that's your title um what about dialogue then feel oh, I, yeah I, yeah I just I did manage to get some of uh, the the local girls jeering tatty head um, I yeah. could have put more in with me saying things to my sister as we went along, you know, but I need to get into the habit of building dialogue in. It's something I need to go and have to build in. So, mm. And you were spotting the scene so brilliantly. So, yeah, try next time, try and bring in a yeah. bit of yeah. dialogue. Anybody else for either the adult or child perspective? It would be great to hear from someone. Patricia, you're looking to go, but I haven't written as much as it has. That's fine. Just a short section would be fantastic. Which one are you are you going to read out from which Charles one? one? I did the same for the adults one as um, past tense, but that's one I found difficult because when you look back, it's not well. It's so insignificant. It's crazy. I think that's why it's harder. Because as a child, as I say, everything's so much bigger, but when you look back, it's not that big. Yeah. Um, so for Janet's one, the twin one, the twins, you know, people staring, that's almost like another glimpse into, because I'm not a twin, you know, mm. so <laughs> that's a nice thought, you know, intriguing part to go off on. Anyway, um, my mother is in the kitchen, she's shouting, but I'm already running down the stairs my shoes clunking loudly on the wooden stairs. I turn round. Hurry up, Philip. We'll be late for school. My little brother skips behind me and we run down the garden path. I hold his small hands and we walk fast on the main road and turn into a side road. 
there's a fresh scent in the air and little green shoots are sleepily opening out in, as from the uh, out into the yellow spring sunlight. I slow down. I don't like this street. More to the point, I don't like that house across the road with the wall that's not much taller than my full height and a flimsy gate. It's inside the gate that scares me. My heart is hammering. Ouch, Patsy, you're squeezing my hands and it hurts, my brother whimpers. I pull him close to my side and edge close to the neat little hedges and boundaries of the gardens on my side. I look down at my feet and resist the urge to look across the road. I don't know how, but each time there's this big dog that leaps up and barks ferociously and I end up there. <laughs> okay. Nice. I was weaving in the anticipation of this house that you're scared of and, and the, the, you know, the wall is nearly as tall as you for yeah, so did you sort of consciously think about dropping in the anticipation of this area? Yes, and yes, I suppose so, because that's how I felt. I remember, but when I wrote the person, it's like, why I prefer cats and dogs, but the idea wasn't because of this experience, it's because I'm just lazy and cats don't need looking after, not because the dogs never bit me and I like dogs. So mm -hmm. it wasn't that. So, yeah, so looking back, it was just this dog kept sparking, and I hated going past that bit. That's all it was. So I suppose you could build on to that if, or move on to another bit, but that was mm. always okay. struck me as annoying that dog now, it's really my school journey. <laughs> yeah, and there was a sense of movement, momentum going on a journey, coming down the stairs and part, you know, and, and nice use of dialogue as well. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you Su Susie? I didn't get any dialogue into this, I'm afraid, but I... <laughs> I'd love to, hear, love to hear something. Okay, so this is um, from the child's perspective. Um, we set off in the dripping dark. I'm so tired, I have a sort of metallic taste in my mouth. Absolutely secure next to Daddy in the car. With the pleasantly scratchy tra travel rug over my bare knees. The bitty taste of Marzine travel sickness tablet just slightly still at the back of my throat, but it's better than the alternative. It's my favourite journey, and here in the dark, with the soothing tones of the shipping forecast or whatever it was on the whatever it is on the car radio, it's the safest place in the world. Would that I could have stayed there forever. Halfway we stop in Richmond Park for a flask of hot sweet tea and a shared Kit Kat and watch the shadowy shapes of deer emerge from the trees. The car smells of leather, a bit like the cupboard under the stairs, where the outdoor sho shoes are kept, polished by Daddy on Saturday mornings and carefully stored on shoe trees. It is a very orderly house. Mummy doesn't come on the journey to see my grandparents, although plight expressions of concern for their well-being will be relayed. Nice. Yeah some lovely details and it's through the detail that we get an insight into your your world the fact that there's order in the cupboard under the stairs with the the shoe tree uh yes um careful not to slip there was a couple of occasions where you slipped into past tense yes yeah very easy to do but that just you know you just read back over it and go through it with a mm. you know how did you feel writing it? You, you said it came quite easily. Does, does it make you want to carry on? Yes, it does. It does. Um, I'm actually feeling quite tired today, so I don't feel it was my best work. But um, yes, I mean, it's nice. It was nice to do it. Um, and it's inspired me to do more, actually. Good. Somebody else. And um, Andrea, are you, would you be happy to... Yeah, but I wrote very little, seeing that I'm sort of a total novice, so, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm from the child's perspective. Okay. I'm in this cold, sterile room with bright white lights above me. I don't recognise the smell, it just hangs in the air. It's not a pleasant smell, almost pungent. I don't like it here. I cannot move, nor can I see as I have my eyes tightly shut. I'm cold. I'm so cold. 
but I cannot say anything, but I can hear them. They sound agitated and I'm frightened of what they will do next. Mm. Now this was written as a one-year-old who was in hospital. Um, wow, yeah. And um, yeah, quite, uh, quite ill. Yes, there's a, a real sense of sort of isolation there. And, and the short sentences or the short words that you were using almost gave the sense of, a, of, a, of an echo around you. And mm. that childlike manner of, of, you know, fragmented thoughts, I thought mm. worked really well. Mm. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Thank you. Hard to write from that perspective. <laughs> Um, yeah, because one, even because I can, you know, it sounds crazy, but it was quite. I nearly died during that experience. Obviously, you know, um, yeah, it's 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 sort of. I can still because I'm I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I actually remember it. I was going to say, um, do you remember that? That's amazing. Mm. I could tell you details. It's unbelievable. Literally, I was, and uh, it it was quite interesting. And I asked people you know whatever i remembered and i confirmed with people and it was true whatever i remembered was literally what happened and obviously i could go into much more graphical details of what they all did Good. and what had happened but obviously that's not what that was all about so but yeah it because it was sort of when you had a one year old you you know your perspective is really limited in and you can sense a lot of things but you don't understand them if that makes sense well, it's very much what Doris Lessing was talking about yes. in her section, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, can I was just going to say, yeah, can I just say about memory and how it can be affected, as she said, by what adults tell us and what photographs we look at. We don't know, do we? Sorry, I'm going off topic. But... No, you're absolutely right. No, it's a really valid point, Janet. How mm -hmm. we, as we get older, everything mars our sort of purity of our memory. We're not quite sure what we've been told, as you were saying, or what, yeah. what is true. Yeah. Alex, would you be happy to share any? Uh, um, so it's yeah. not a lot, and it's a lot of scribbles, so I'll probably fumble. Um, That's all right. Alexandra, Mrs. Marriott's voice cuts through the dreading silence. Uh, yeah, the dreading silence. I try to ignore the faces that gaze in my direction um, as I wind among the tables. My rubber soles are muffled on the green carpet. My mind is not following. It's cowering in the plastic shelter of the faded red chair I've just left. That's as far as I got. <laughs> it's really hard knowing there's a time pressure and the blank sheet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I love it. I love the way your mind, you know, you're physically going to the front of the class, but your mind is, it's jet lagged behind. I think it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely images and color, use of colours. Mm. Um, yeah, thank you. Keep going. <laughs> um, Nikki. <laughs> oh dear, well I'm uh, not a natural writer at all and um, certainly um, until I covered onto these workshops it's not something I've sort of particularly aspired to um but I just I'll start I'll, I'll share a little bit of what I did from actually my ad for writing as a from an adult's perspective mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and um I just to give you some context I've written from a child's perspective sort of at my grandpa's house because they're sort of quite childish memories I don't remember them particularly well but my visits to the granny and granddad I remember quite well but um I yeah, I suppose trying to sort of weave a bit more um, interest into it for the reader. But um, it's literally almost just like I've downloaded my thoughts into a bit of a diary, so you'll have to sort of bear with me. <laughs> um, visiting Granny and Grandad was always exciting. I always loved seeing Grandad, who would be sure to tell me on every occasion that I was his favourite granddaughter and make the shh sign. My mother tells me it's on the night I was uh, born that he was in the pub with the pudding club um he bought everyone drinks and ended up being carried home he only paid his tab when he returned a week or so later i always uh, i always remember granny and granddad being very sociable hosting family that's me um my mum's 
uh, me and my cousins, um, as well as the numerous friends from the village. Um, my brothers and I would play in the garden um, whilst Grandad would follow everybody around with a video camera glued to his face. Granny would often sit in her chair with her water and whiskey, barking instructions to us. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, bit rough and ready. <laughs> Lovely characters there, the, of your, your grandparents. Um, and yeah, nice, a lovely tone that you've pictured of this family life. And again, it does make me want to hear more you know, about how it evolves and, and where it goes. But yeah, keep going with it. Did you, do, for, from your, did you write the child, did you do both from that point of view? <laughs> um, no, my child's perspective was from my uh, memories of my grandpa on my father's side, this is on my mother's side, because um, he died when I was much younger. And so my memories actually are quite childish there. So, um, mm. yeah. yeah. But yeah. thank you all so much for sharing them. Mm. That's everyone, isn't it? Everyone shared because it's really fantastic to hear and, um, and to just see and listen to sort of the rich qualities that you can go insight into different perspectives and um, things to talk about. It's just a matter of getting it down on the page. Any questions before we finish? We've run over, I'm sorry, but um, just before we finish, any thoughts? I think it's quite scary writing <coughs> Sorry. your memories for uh, and sharing it aloud with others. Yeah. So when you say write something personal, it's different to write something that's not to do with you, but it's hard mm -hmm. when it's your own self sharing it. And how <coughs> would you, how would, you're right. <laughs> I'm sorry, that got a in oh, no. You're absolutely right. It's What's very... It? best way to overcome that shyness so just I don't know what you call it I think um pra practicing doing more of you know sharing with with friends or writers groups or doing courses like this I mean you kind of get used to opening up and sharing your work and it becomes less of a sort of hurdle to get to get over I think um it's so always, one, it's so, yeah. always though, a strange thing to share work, I think. It doesn't ever come, you know, there might be some things that are easier than others, but I think it's always, it's, our, it's very private. Um, and so you need to have a support to be able to, to share this work with. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm really glad that each of you was really respectful of each other. And we had a nice sort of, a group feeling yeah, very it, can, it can feel you know a bit daunting um so having a supportive group i think is really important yeah yeah <coughs> Super. Mm. yeah okay well thank you so much i think that we'll stop there because it's 20 yeah 20 to 8 now but um well thank you very much mm. thank you yeah, yeah great you. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. It's been very informative and uh, such a lovely sort of safe, supportive group. It's been, it's been great. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Ah, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to um, say um, a massive thank you to Emma on behalf of us all at Genesis for taking the time to put together this workshop and uh, take us through all those different texts and exercises. Um, and thank you all um, so much for engaging in the discussions and sharing your writing. Um, mm. As uh, we all are very aware, these are unprecedented times and mm. are forcing us to try new things such as these workshops. So it's um, really um, encouraging to see you here. Um, but uh, we, yes, are always open to new things. So if you have any events that you would like to see, um, any stories you would like to share, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We really welcome your feedback. And thank you very I hope, much. I hope we can have another session with Emma. If we could, yeah. I would, I'd like another one. But anyway, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very much, thanks. everybody. Thanks for everything. Nice to see everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.